Good morning again. Welcome to the Battles of the We're glad you're with us here today. Uh, this is uh, September the 11th when we're recording this. And so we do want to make sure that we remember all those people that were um, that have that were involved in the tragedy from uh, back in back in the day when we had the uh, terrorist attack. And uh, we do uh, 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 families are still torn apart as a result of that. We do want to honor those who gave their lives uh, uh, in defense of our country. Even today, we thank you for those of you maybe in the military that are supporting our families and our, our way of life and those who gave the ultimate sacrifice and those that are still suffering today as a result of fighting for our freedoms around the world. So having said that, now we're going to get into our study of the scriptures today. We're still studying in Proverbs, I mean, in, I keep saying Proverbs, but in the parables, <clears throat> still as we continue our study on who is Jesus, we're now into session number 58. <clears throat> it's a long time. And we still have a lot to cover, uh, but we are going to be covering parables. We have uh, we identified 46 parables that we're covering. We're going to be looking at 29 and 30 today, so we can see we're over halfway through studying the parables. Again, the parables are very important because that's Jesus' method of teaching. So we've actually been doing studying now on the teachings of Jesus. Not necessarily the life of Jesus, but the teaching of Jesus because that's important. And so, you know, when Jesus says something, it's important we should stop what we're doing, focus on what he has to say, and then see what it means to us. So today we're going to be studying, uh, we're going to be looking in Luke chapter 15. We're going to be covering the first 10 verses in chapter 15, but there's two parables here that are listed. So we're going to, uh, uh, we're going to look at those uh, as we go along. Before we get started, let's start with a word of prayer. Lord, I thank you so much for this opportunity that we can have, that we can study your word. I thank you, Lord, for your son who came to die on the cross for our sins. I pray, Lord, right now that you would help us to be able to share him with others so that others may know who he is also. I pray for this series as we go through it, Lord, that we could glean some knowledge and better understand who Jesus is so that we again can share him with others. For it's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. So we are, um, um, if you begin your Bibles, Luke chapter 15, uh, beginning with verse 1. We're going to read the first seven verses as we start this one. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost, until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice unto me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than any over more than over more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Verse one. Let's break this down. He said, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners to hear him. Now there's four groups that are listed here, two different categories. Um, the the crowds had come to hear Jesus. You had publicans, which were tax collectors, the outcasts of the society, one of the most hated in the community. They were considered by the Jews to be traitors. These were the publicans. Then you had sinners. Publicans were always classified as with sinners, because they were not they because they were known for cheating people. So always classified. Now many publicans were attracted to Jesus. Matthew was a publican. And he was called to be a disciple. Uh, Matthew 9, 9 through 13. And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of customs. And he said to him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And he came to pass as Jesus sat at meat in the house. Behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and, and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth thou eat your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that behold need not a physician, but they that are sick. 
Go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. See, Jesus was a friend to publicans. He's a friend to sinner. He's a friend to you and I, who are also sinners. You see, the scribes and the Pharisees, they want to think themselves more valuable than they were. They want to think themselves righteous above everything. But the truth is, we need to think of ourselves as low, think of ourselves as sinners, think of ourselves as no one better than anybody else, that we are in need of the Savior, so are they. Be careful not to judge other people because we are sinners too. Uh, that doesn't mean we shouldn't be fighting against false religion or standing up for what is right. Sure we should. See, we have a story of not just Matthew was a disciple, but we also see the major story that our children always sing about, Zacchaeus. I'm not going to sing it for you today, but you know, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. Wee little man was he? Climbed a sycamore tree. Anyway, you know the story. Well, see, in Luke 19, verses 1 through 10, And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans. Again, chief among the publicans. And he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus who he was, and could not for the press, because he was of little statue. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying what that he was gone to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. Again, publicans and sinners. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my goods I will give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusations, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said to him, This day is salvation come into this house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Interesting enough, we see Zacchaeus got saved because we see Zacchaeus' works. He wasn't saved by his works. His works came after he believed in Jesus. After he came, after he saved Jesus, saved him, then his works changed. That's when he gave half his stuff to the poor. That's when he redid. That's when he did his works. See, when we're saved. It's not works. Is not what gets us saved. But as James says, works is evidence that we've been saved. It's, it's a change in your attitude. It's a change in the way you treat people. If you haven't changed anything in your life since you made a commitment to Christ, did you really make a commitment to Christ? That's another story of another day. But the point is, Zacchaeus was also a publican. So you see, Jesus had a lot of following among the publicans and the sinners. And it says these publicans and sinners gathered to hear Jesus and his message of hope for redemption from a life they knew was in need of redemption. These people made no means about it. They knew they needed a change. They needed to be righteous with God. They were not. They knew they were sinners. First step to get anybody saved is knowing that they're lost. These publicans and sinners came to Jesus because they knew they were in need of a Savior. They were in need of something, okay? Verse 2, And the Pharisees and scribes murmured. We keep hearing that word murmured a lot. They murmured a lot. Uh, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. <clears throat> now, the scribes and the Pharisees in the first century were two large, distinct groups. The scribes uh, and some of the Pharisees clearly were scribes. They were two different groups, but some of them were scribes. You know, scribes had the knowledge of the law and could draft legal documents. You know, they could do contracts for marriage, for divorce, loans, inheritances, mortgage, sell of land, and the like. So scribes do all that stuff. And every village had at least one scribe. It's kind of like your, your uh, um, a person puts that stamp on your stuff. My mind wonders sometimes, but you know what I mean. Um, the uh, uh, the Pharisees. Now the Pharisees believed in the resurrection, which was different than the the a lot of the uh, the scribes did not believe in that that. But the the Pharisee believed in the resurrection, followed legal traditions that were not written in the scripture, but the the that were they were not written in the scriptures that they had the Bible that they had at the time but they were traditions of men. And the Pharisees were big on the traditions of men. 
Now, like the scribes, they're also well-known legal experts. They were more legally experts in the traditions of the fathers than they were in the law, but there's some of it obviously overlapped uh, in some of the memberships between the group. It appears from the... Um, uh, that the, the Pharisees was a small landowners and traders and not professional scribes. So most of the Pharisees were basically landowners. They were small farmers, you could say, or vineyard owners or something like that. But it says here that they murmured, saying this man received a sinner and eateth with them. Murmured. Now if you define murmur, it means complain in a low tone. Murmur, you know, Boy, I can't believe he did that. You know, you've heard people, haven't you murmured before? I have. To criticize or grumble about the actions of others. It can be sub a subdued expression or discontent of anger. So these two groups kind of murmured under their breath about Jesus. They didn't confront him directly, but they murmured about him. Now these two groups gathered to find fault. The scribes of the Pharisees. Now remember, the other group showed up because they wanted a change in their life. The scribes and Pharisees showed up because they wanted to murmur and complain. They were looking for something that they might accuse Jesus of. You know, they're waiting for him to slip up, you could say. They were willing, they were waiting for a mistake, and then they could pounce upon him for his mistake because they knew all the legal tradition. So they began to murmur. And it says, saying, what were they murmuring? This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. So the complaint was that Jesus became, Jesus welcomed sinners and even ate with them. He socialized with them. Uh, they thought this was saying something horrible at Jesus and condemned him, but in reality, it's the glorious truth of the gospel, isn't it? That Jesus welcomes sinners. He welcomes sinners. Aren't you glad we who are sinners, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, that we as sinners have a Savior who welcomes sinners? So Jesus does welcome sinners. Therefore, even you and I can become one with him. We see the conflict of the world that even continues today. The lost recognize their sin and need the Savior who welcomes all with the open arms and the false religious crowd that's unwelcoming, unloving towards the lost and certainly towards the Savior and his love for them. So we can see the conflict is here. The lost who needed a Savior and then the religious crowd that rejected the Savior. Verse 3. And he, and he said this parable unto them, saying, Now, when the crowds gathered, the sinners needed the Savior and desired to know him, and the Pharisees, who also needed the Savior but rejected him, uh, and desired all to do the same by silencing him, they didn't want anybody to be saved, so they're trying to stop him from saying anything. <coughs> Jesus speaks this parable to the Pharisees and the scribes. He's not preaching this. He's not speaking this to his disciples. He's not speaking this to the lost. He's speaking this to the scribes and the Pharisees, directly targeting them with his remarks. Verse 4. What man of you, scribes and Pharisees, what man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? So the man of you, he, this is an emphatic, what man of you? Who of you, he could say. Now, Jesus spoke this and the following parable to justify his conduct in receiving and conversing with sinners. He says, I'm going to tell you why. You will ask me, how can I, why would I eat with sinners and publicans? And I'm going to tell you why. He said, which of you, emphatically, which man of you, he says, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them. Now, this is a very small percentage uh, uh, that would be well acceptable for shepherds. Most shepherds, if they lose some, they have some loss over the course of time. So if they lost one of their hundred sheep, they still have the 99. Sheep tend to wander off. They become distracted by something or someone outside the flock. Uh, they get left behind as the flock continues to move or walk away to pursue something else of interest. So he says, "What? which man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness? So not all shepherds would leave the ninety and nine to pursue the one lamb. 
Not all of them would do that. They said, well, it's only one. I'm not, I'm not going to go back after that one sheep, that one lamb. Now, this appeals to the men's sense of compassion for their poor lamb. He appeals to it. You've got a lamb, a small lamb they were left behind. What are you going to do? You know, you have compassion for your sheep. Remember, the eastern sheep loved their, eastern shepherds loved their sheep. They loved their sheep. Their sheep followed them. They heard their voice. They called them by name. So if you lost a sheep that you called by name, you're going to stop what you're doing and go find that sheep. You're looking for Fluffy or Spotty or whatever it might be. You're looking for him. It was not about the loss compared to the whole flock, but the lamb being lost and needed saving. It wasn't about the numbers. It was about the individual lamb. Because the, the shepherd loved his sheep and called them by name, it said. It says that it uh, doth leave the 99 in the wilderness. Now, the term wilderness, this is the plain where most sheep were pastured. So they were safe for a while, at least, being all left alone until the shepherd returned. So he left them in a safe location. He didn't just leave them in peril and go after the other. He made sure they were safe before he went after the one. He says, and go out after that which is lost until he find it. This is a deliberate act of pursuit. Um, he was pursuing that one that was lost. It was a diligent search. He says, until he find it. He didn't return until he found it. Failure was not acceptable to him. This is perhaps what is said in, uh, in the parable. is built really upon Ezekiel 34. Uh, uh, Ezekiel 34, verses 1 and 2. The bad shepherd. No doubt these scribes and Pharisees knew this scripture so they could relate to this. Ezekiel 34, 1 and 2. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophecy and say, prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto shepherds. Woe be to the shepherds of Israel. Verse 34, for me. Neither have ye bought, brought again that which was driven away. Neither have ye sought that which was lost. These were negative things about these shepherds. When they were scattered, my sheep wandered through all the mountains, and upon every hill, high hill, yea, my flocks were scattered upon the face of the earth, and none did search or seek after him. And as a result, verse 7 through 10, Therefore, ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, saith the Lord God, surely because my flock became a prey and my flock became meat to every beast of the field, because there was no shepherd, neither did my sheep shepherds search for my flock. But the shepherds fled themselves and fed not my flock. Therefore, O ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand and cause them to cease from feeding the flock. Neither shall the shepherds feed them any more, for I will deliver my flock from my mouth that they may not be meat for them. So we see the bad shepherd here. So he said, which of you, which of you now, are you the bad shepherd in Ezekiel chapter 34? Or are you the good shepherd in chapter 34? He continues on, Ezekiel 34. For thus saith the Lord God, behold, I, even I, will, doth, will both search my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. Verse 16, I will seek that which was lost and bring again that which was driven away and will bind up that which was broken and will strengthen that which was sick. So Jesus is asking them, are you the good shepherd or the bad shepherd? Are you one of these? Which of you, having the lost, the sheep, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? Ezekiel chapter 34. Are you the bad shepherd or are you the good shepherd? That's what he's asking them. No doubt these are scribes and Pharisees. They knew the scriptures so they could quickly relate to Ezekiel 34. Verse 5. And when he had found it, he layeth on his shoulders rejoicing. After the diligent search, not if, but when he found it. Notice he didn't say if he found it. He said when. The good shepherd just stopped seeking until he found the lost sheep. He layeth on his shoulder. He doesn't drive the sheep back. 
He doesn't lead the sheep back. He carries the sheep back. He carries the small lamb. He's the one that does the work. He ensures that the sheep is returned. The high priest garment has six, tri six tribes on each side of the 12 tribes of Israel. The, the high priest had six tribes on each side as a sign of his carrying them as his responsibility. So when Jesus said he picked them up, put them on their shoulders, it's like the, 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 the high priest puts the nations of Israel on his shoulder. He carries them to God. So this is representative here by the shepherd carrying the lamb on his shoulders. Then he says rejoicing. Instead of being upset at the lamb, the good shepherd rejoices. Why? Because sheep stray. It's part of their behavior. Sheep stray. To get mad at something for doing what it does naturally is not really it's just, you know, finding them and bringing them back to the fold was a great sense of accomplishment for the, of the high priest, I mean, for the, the shepherd. I always tell this, why do we get upset when the lost does something bad? They're lost, for goodness sake. They're going to do things bad. Why? They're lost. Why would you get upset at that? You know, I always wonder when I see these things about these people that have pet tigers or, and lions, and then suddenly the lion attacks and kills them. Well, why would you be surprised at that? A lion is a, is a predator. I mean, why would you get upset when that happens? Why would you be surprised? I mean, I'm not saying you're getting upset, but why would you be surprised at that? See, the sheep wander off. The shepherd was excited to find the sheep and found him and rejoiced. The work was done by the shepherd. The shepherd went and found the sheep. And then the shepherd put him on his shoulders and carried him back and rejoiced at finding the sheep. Verse 6, And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors. So after retrieving his lost lamb, the good shepherd calls all his friends and neighbors to tell them the good news. Now, friends and neighbors. Friends are those that share a deep connection with him. These are people who are his friends. They have a deep connection with him. Okay? Neighbors, interesting enough, the word neighbor is listed many times in the Bible, but there's really no clear definition of what it means. You know, Jesus said to love thy neighbor as thyself is the second commandment. Matthew 22, verse 37 and 40, Jesus said to them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the laws. You know, so based upon the parable of the Good Samaritan, a neighbor is really anyone who cares for you. You know, anyone who, you, anyone who cares for you when you have a need, that is a neighbor. Even if it costs you something. That's a neighbor. So these people here, your friends had a personal connection with you and your neighbor were those who would be willing to help you hunt for that sheep if you needed to be hunted for. He said, rejoice with me for I found my sheep which was lost. He shares the joy of finding and rescuing his lost lamb with them. It's a sense of accomplishment. It's a great thing. My sheep, I lost. I found it, guys. I found it. They were excited for him. They had a sense of excitement. Then Jesus turns back to them, the scribes and Pharisees. And he says, I say unto you. Remember now, he's referring to, they were questioning him, participating with, socializing with these uh, publicans and sinners. And Jesus gives them that parable. Then he turns to them and he says, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over the 99 just persons which need no repentance. It's human nature that the recovery of an object that's in danger of being lost forever uh, has a greater intense joy than the possessions that are all safe. You know what I mean? Everything's safe, you, you, you take it for granted, unfortunately. But when you find something you've lost, you have a great sense of accomplishment, a great sense of joy, relief that you found it. But he says, I say unto you likewise, joy shall be in heaven. Among the angels of God, compared to Luke 15, 10, heavenly beings are thus represented as rejoicing over those who repent on earth. The angels rejoice, Jesus said, at one soul being saved. The angels rejoice. 
They see the guilt and danger of people. They know what God has done for the race. And they rejoice at the recovery of any from the guilty ruins of sin. They know that this person, the angels know for sure, they've seen it over and over again, of people who don't accept Jesus Christ, who die in their sins and go to hell. What a terrible time. They see the agonizing pain and torture of those people in hell. And this agonizing pain is beaten with many stripes. It's a torment. It's a place of torment that no one wants to go to. No one wants to go there, regardless of what they say. I saw another person on a sign says, I want to go to hell, but that's where my friends are. <laughs> what friends are those? Hell's a place of isolation and loss and torture. It's not a place you want to go. The angels saw that. So whenever someone was saved, they knew that they were saved out of that awful place, and they rejoiced. Whew, there's another one. There's another one saved. I'm glad they didn't have to go there. There's one more. How many more? How many more can these men win to God? Because that's God's plan, right? Go you therefore into all the world. See, it's our job to go. So these angels rejoice. He said, over one sinner that repenteth, more than over 99. The rebel, the, the one rebels against God, however great his sin may be. A sinner will perish unless he repents. Plain and simple. But all heavens rejoices when they do repent because it recovers him back to the love of God. It gets him out of the pit of hell and puts him back where God can do things great for him. Uh, Matthew 9, 13. Go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous but the sinners to repentance. See, Jesus said, I have come to snatch these people that are on their way to hell, out of hell, and put them in heaven. And the angels rejoiced at that news. That's why the angels were singing when Jesus came. Hallelujah, the king has come. Why? Because the king has come. Why? To sit on the throne? No. He came to save lost men. The angels were singing day after day after day, going into hell and torment, and they saw the Savior come. Now they have hope. Now these people don't have to die and go to hell anymore. They rejoice greatly at that. Jesus was declaring to the Pharisees and the scribes that God is always willing to forgive to the point that he himself diligently does the seeking for the lost souls. Luke 19.10 said, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That is his mission in life. His mission to be here was to seek and to save that which was lost. And he did that by living a sinless life and dying on the cross for their sins, yours and mine. That's parable 29. Let's look at the 30th parable. This is not as long. But there's some really fascinating things in these next three verses. So he just got to tell them that. Then he gives them another example. He says, either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, does not light, light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it. And when she have found it, she call her friends and her neighbors, there's that word again, together saying, rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I have lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of angels over one sinner that repenteth. Verse 8, he says, either. Now Jesus continues this point to scribes and Pharisees from the last one. Uh, uh, what woman has ten, piece, ten pieces of silver? Ten pieces of silver. This is actually uh, drachmas. Ten drachmas, which is Grecian money. And the drachma was about the value of 15 cents. Now the whole sum was about a dollar and a half or six shillings. There was two possible reasons why the woman may have been so eager to find the coin. Two reasons. I like the second one better, but I'm going to read it to you. I will tell you, on the surface, you would think it's because a uh, matter of necessity. You know, four pence does not sound like very much, but it was more than a whole day's wage for a working man in Palestine. It was a day's wage. Uh, these people always lived on the edge of things. A very little stood between them and real hunger. Uh, not all of them ate more than one meal a day. The woman may have searched with intensity because if she didn't find it, the family would not eat that day. 
I mean, it was pretty bad if that was the case. But I tend to believe the second one better. Now, let me tell you, I hadn't heard this before, and I was fascinated by this reading of this, and so therefore I wanted to read it. I, wanted to, I, I really believe this makes much more sense. You know, the Bible makes sense. It says, Either Which woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and sleep? Let's, let's look at that other opportunity. Uh, the mark of married women was that they had a headdress, and the headdress was made of ten silver coins linked together by a silver chain. Now, it's interesting that the passage of Scripture says that the, uh, uh, the woman having ten pieces of silver, specifically said pieces of silver, ten pieces of silver. Now, the ten pieces of silver also was made up of the headband for women that showed their marriage, kind of like a wedding band, like a diamond ring. So I believe this that makes that logical sense. So I think everyone here knows that he's talking about this headband, perhaps. She has 10 pieces of silver. She has this headband. And um, um, so she it, it would have taken years for a young woman to gather that much, uh, those 10 coins, that then would be made into this headband for her that would show she was a married woman. Uh, it was like kind of the equivalent of like a diamond ring. Now, this might tell you why if she lost one of these coins, why it would have been so emotional for her. You know, so she searched for, as any woman would search, if she lost a diamond out of her ring. You know, multiple diamonds, lost one of her diamonds out of her ring. She's going to search high and low, isn't she? She's going to search one. It says if she lose one piece. One piece of that tin ring, tin thing around her head. If she lost one piece, does not light a candle and sweep the house diligently looking for it. It would be, it, it would not be difficult to lose a coin, by the way, in Pillow Palestine, uh, in the peasant's house. It would might take a long time because they're very dark houses. They typically lit by one circular window and not much more, about eighteen inches across. So it was pretty small. The floor was beaten earth, covered with dry weeds or rustle you know, russes. So it was just, it was just, so it wouldn't have the dust come back up. Uh, looking for a coin uh, was like looking for a needle in a haystack. So the woman swept the floor, hoping that she might find the corn in the clint or glee, uh, you know, hear it tink or something. So she swept the floor looking for it. And she didn't stop until she found it. That's dedication. Failure was not an option. You know, I've seen, I've known people that's lost their jewelry or something, or lost, let's say, lost a diamond in their ring, and boy, they search hard, high and low for it. Many do not find it because it's such a small thing. Well, some, I guess, are bigger than others, but they search diligently for it. But those who have found it were so relieved. It said when she found it, she calls her friends and her neighbors, saying together, Rejoice to me, for I found my peace that which was lost. I found my peace that which was lost. You understand? Not my money, but my peace. Again, goes back, that makes sense of the headband. Regardless of the reason for the coin being so valuable, it's easy to think of the woman's joy when she finally saw the elusive coin and held it in her hand again. I imagine, though, that headband, boy, that would have really been important. Uh, she said, For I have found the peace which I lost. You know, that's why I said the possible connection to the headdress with the piece that was lost. If you've ever seen a woman who lost her wedding ring and, and or a diamond in her engagement ring and found it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, that's the type of excitement that she had. And so Jesus referring to that excitement that they had, not just finding it, not just doing that, but this dedication, but this excitement was such a relief. It's more of a relief, I think, than anything else. That, whew, thank goodness. Oh, boy. I was worried about that. You ever lost something like that, and you found it, and you feel, oh, my goodness. That was close. I'm glad I found that. That was tough. I knew if I lost, I don't know what I would do. That's kind of the attitude that they that Jesus said he had. And so verse 10 says, Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of angels of God over one sin that repentance. Understand, they feel the same sense of relief. Thank goodness. This soul is not going to hell. Thank goodness. He said, just like the just like the first parable, here's another example. Jesus programs this truth for the second time 
as a matter of emphasis. He gives them a second time to emphasize the, the importance of this, the relationship. I think the second one, to me, is more about the emotions. Uh, uh, it, it's more about the emotion. I think the first one is about the value and the connection and the connect the, the love of that animal, but it's more about the, because you're talking about the 99, leaving the 99 for the one, it's about value. The second one is about relief. I think the second parable is about the relief that we feel, the rejoicing that God feels, the rejoicing that angels feel when soul is saved, is snatched from the way to hell to heaven. I think that's the sense. See, Jesus shares another glimpse in heaven as he tells us there's joy in heaven in the presence of angels over one sinner that repents. As we, we must finally note that these two parables are not simply two ways of stating the same thing. There's a difference. The sheep went lost through sheer foolishness. It did not think about it. Many a man would escape if he thought in time. The coin was lost at no fault of its own. Many a man has led astray. God will not hold him guiltless who has taught another to sin. So we see there's two things. The sheep was lost at no fault of their own. And the coin was lost as carelessness. The sheep were led astray because they're lost. The sheep are lost. The sheep don't know God. The sheep are just a sheep. Right? A sheep will go astray because they don't know any better. And therefore, God has to help them. Therefore, we have to diligently seek for them. Help them. Help God. Help them find God. And then God will carry them back to the fold. But the coin, on the other hand, was lost through carelessness. If we aren't careful in our lives, we see people who are lost through carelessness. Now next week we're going to look at the third parable in this series of talking about value. And we're going to be dealing with the parable of the prodigal son, which is going to take the entire time. Uh, uh, we'll see that the son deliberately went lost. It was an accident. He deliberately chose to go lost. Uh, he callously turned his back on his father. So we'll see that. And uh, we'll, we'll do that. Uh, that's all we have time for today. I appreciate you being here today. I appreciate as we continue to study who is Jesus. These are two powerful parables that tells us that Jesus really wants us to be saved. That the angels in heaven rejoice when one is saved out of the pits of hell. They know the reality of it. That's why they can rejoice. They can see the relief. <sighs> like the woman with the headdress. I sure am glad I got that. And then share that knowledge with everybody. Do we share great blessings from God with everybody? Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity that we have that we can study your word. Thank you, Lord, for your witness. Thank you, Lord, for the angels singing, shouting, and praise when a soul is saved. Help us, Lord, hear that shout ourselves. If the angels in heaven should be praising God every time a soul is saved, why aren't we? I pray, Lord, you help us to be as compassionate about this, as committed to this, as these were today. For so in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. I thank you for your time and for your attention today. Next week, as we said, we'll be continuing our study, and we will be looking in the parable of the prodigal son. Until then, God bless you. Have a great day.